America Live, brought to you from the Eternal Word Television Studios in Birmingham, Alabama. our church. This whole network is built on trust. The essence of evangelization is to tell everybody Jesus loves you. We are all called to be great saints. Don't miss the opportunity. Well, thank you. We just have a great amount of, of our family, our extended family here tonight, and they're from everywhere. And I had a, a great joy today. I have two friends I haven't seen in 50, hmm, 51, 52 years. It's Ben DeCola and his wife and their friend who drove them down. And we have a new sister this evening we're very happy with, Sister Bernadette, who comes to us from Canton, Ohio Monastery. And now we're 29. And we thank God for that. That's not a lot of people, but it is when you're fitting them in a place that was built for 14. <laughs> so we've been pulling this way and pushing out that way and that way. <clears throat> anyway, uh, it's kind of far back here, don't you think? Yeah, let's see if we can't push it. Oh, well. Wait a minute, I gotta lean over here, twist my arm so I can get this water. Anyway, tonight, <laughs> only somebody knows television would have thought of that. Thing. <laughs> There's our good friend Louisa from Mexico, who is in uh, television. Now, we're going to talk tonight about light and darkness. You know, today we live in darkness, we don't know it. A lot of people live in darkness and they don't know it. Well, let's see what St. Paul says about this before I read you the most hilarious litany I ever read in my whole life. <laughs> I had one in Denver, you remember, a year or two ago. They had this uh, litany that said, uh, God, take her risks. I thought, boy, if he takes the risk, we're in trouble. <laughs> or God of our dreams, you know. But this makes that litany look kind of holy, which it wasn't. Anyway, you'll have fun with it. In the uh, first of Romans, it said, ever since God created the world, his everlasting power and deity, however invisible, See, God is invisible, and yet he's very visible. You cannot see a sunrise or a sunset without seeing God, can you, huh? We're looking for a farm. So the other day, uh, a real estate agent found a farm. And it was three miles in before you even got to look at it. And when we looked at it, I was amazed. It was kind of, uh, well, it, it kind of went out like an island almost, went like this, and around it was a river. I said, a river? Well, I walked as far as I could, and the other sisters walked much further. So we went around, and we got, we stopped off, and they went on a, an incline. 
And when they got there, there was the most beautiful river. It was foaming up, and cold, ice cold, ice cold. And, and they came up. And they were all out of shape, you know, because it went. <laughs> I said, Lord, you got to walk up and down that a little more. But the whole point was that in that river was rainbow trout. I said, rainbow trout in Alabama? And, and I thought, rainbow trout can't be in Alabama. But they say it is because the water is absolutely freezing. And there in that tiny spot, nobody's been maybe for years, and years perhaps, and I thought, here is God in this magnificent place, very small, with all this beauty and nobody sees it. Isn't that amazing? You know, you, you see a waterfall, and he could have made just trout, but he's a rainbow trout. They live in ice water. I say, there's snakes of that thing. I said, no, it's too cold. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it was amazing to me that hidden behind many trees and shrubs and bushes that that thing's been running all the time we've been here 32 years <sighs> nobody sees it you know it almost makes you think that some creation is useless but it's not it's not useless because God sees it and he takes delight in his creation it was the most beautiful thing. Sisters came up from that long walk and went, I don't believe it. Yeah. The power of God in his creation. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. It's just a small, small place. But on that place is the power of God. Now, there's a lot of things in our life that we don't see right in front of us. We're either accustomed to looking at a sunrise or a sunset or a waterfall. I went to Niagara Falls one time. I was giving a talk and they said, you want to see Niagara Falls? They said, yeah. Well, you could hear it. And I went over there and I watched that water cascading. Oh. It's been done, it does it day and night. It's been there for only God knows how long, hundreds of years, coming down with such power. And I'll make a bet that the people up there in New York and Canada, they, they just pass by now because they've gotten used to it. Well, you know, we can do that with God. <coughs> He's everywhere, but we don't see him. We don't see it. We don't see him in the poor because they're poor. We don't see him in the sick because they're sick. We only see him in the beautiful. Or, but you see, he's everywhere. And, and this is what St. Paul is saying here, that God is everywhere, and you have to be in the light to see God. Those in darkness see something else. And I want to explain that to you. He said he has always been there for the mind to see in the things he has made. My sisters are telling me something again. I don't know how I do this. There it goes. For the mind to see. But he said, instead, those in darkness make nonsense out of it. And he said, their empty minds are darkened. Now, this is St. Paul, so don't tell me. I didn't say it. Yeah, I'm reading it. And the more they call themselves philosophers, the more stupid they grew. 
so much for St. Paul. I like St. Paul. When he thinks something is stupid, he says stupid. <laughs> and I'm going to read you something that I think is stupid. <laughs> You're going to laugh at this. <sighs> I've had a hard day, so I need to laugh myself. Okay, this is a litany. You know what a litany is, don't you? Well, it says, In the beginning was God, in the beginning the source of all that is. In the beginning, God was yearning. Huh? For what? <laughs> if he's God, he wouldn't yearn for anything, would he? I mean, if he's God and he yearns, he's lacking something. Oh, it's going to get better. <laughs> God moaning. Moaning. Laboring. God giving birth. Oh. God loved what she made. Ah. It said it was good. This is a new concept of the book of Genesis. Then God, knowing that all that is good is shared, held the earth tenderly in her arms. God yearned for relationship. Do these people know there is a trinity? Huh? Do they know there is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and there is nothing, absolutely nothing lacking in God? We were born to share the earth. Well, boy, if I was born to share the earth, y'all can have my share. <laughs> in the earth was a seed, Nothing, nothing about creation. God created the seed. God created the earth. In the seed was the grain, and the grain was the harvest, and the harvest was the bread. In the bread there was power. Ah. Now we know the hidden agenda of all my liberal brothers and sisters listening to me tonight. Now, and God said, you are my people Hmm. My friends, my lovers, lovers, Ooh. my sisters and brothers, and the power, you shall all eat of the power. What are we talking about? Doesn't that sound stupid to you? Then God gathered up her courage. Oh, yeah. <laughs> God gathered up her courage. If it's a her, she needed courage. <laughs> and he said, let there be bread. And God's sisters and her friends and her lovers knelt on the earth. Now, isn't that absolutely blasphemous? They planted the seeds. Oh, listen to this one. You got it. Are you braced? Huh? Are you all braced for this one? And they prayed for rain. To who? <laughs> God prayed for rain. Can you beat that? Thank you. <laughs> Mm. Sang for the grain, cracked the weeds, pounded the corn, kneaded the dough, and kindled a fire, and filled all creation with the smell of fresh bread. <sighs> <coughs> and then, we, the sisters of God, say today, all shall eat bread and all shall have power. The hidden agenda of our feminists is not 
to be priests is to have power. And we shall say today, we shall all have power and bread. Let there be bread and let there be power. And by the power of God, women are blessed. And by the women of God, the bread is blessed. And by the power of bread, the power of women and the power of God, people are blessed. And they all said, got to listen to this one, everybody. And the bread is rising. <laughs> A woman sent me this from uh, Washington, the state of Washington, Goldendale. And I, I had to share it with you because my friends, please, if, if you go to a retreat or to a talk and they start with this nonsense and stupidity, please walk out, will you? Walk out. Because this is total darkness. Do we see it? Do we see the darkness? Light is something is someone. Okay? Light is someone. And in the book of Genesis, God said, let there be what? Light. And there was light. And he separated the light from the darkness. And we can interpret that in many ways. There were the angels, pure, holy spirits, all light. And then they rebelled against God. Satan said, I shall ascend to the throne of God. Pride. How aren't we saying that today? I shall ascend. Where? Where are you going? And God separated the light from the darkness. And Satan and all his cohort left the angels of light and all disappeared into hell, which they created. In today's world, there is much darkness and it's advertised. It's in confused theology and confused concepts of love and a misdirected compassion, all the things. Because God is not a sheep. And if I believe this litany, I am in darkness, meaning my mind is blind to truth, to the real God, to the God who is all powerful. Because when our minds are clouded, this is what St. Paul says, we make nonsense out of logic. And they exchange the glory of an immortal God for a worthless imitation. See? This is a worthless imitation. And we, we exchange all the beauty of God. They are not true to themselves anymore, you see. When you veer from truth, you veer from God. God is truth. And if I veer from truth, I veer from God. And that's what St. Paul says here in Romans, first chapter. He said, we, we, ha we, we take away the glory of God and, and we create a worthless imitation for the image of mortal man. Birds, reptiles, the cosmic God, trees, 
there's something so beautiful about a tree, but it's not God, you see. And we already have a God, the one true holy God. If you are looking for another God, you're going towards darkness. What is your God? Who is your God? I think we got to ask ourselves once in a while, who is my God? Is it the Lord God, the one true God? Is it his only son, Jesus? Is it the power of the Spirit? Or do I want a God that measures to my height, who thinks the way I think? Isn't that true today, huh? We want a God that thinks like me. <laughs> you can't have a God that thinks like you because you don't think straight. <laughs> you know, we're off in left field half the time. <laughs> Remember that old thing of, who was it? Yeah, years and years and years ago, Abbott and Costello. He wanted to know about baseball. And he says, who's on first? He said, no, who's on third? So what's on third? What's on third? So I told you, who's on third? <laughs> no, no, I want to know who's on first. He says, I just told you who's on third. And we went around and around. It was hysterical. But you know, we do that in our daily lives. We're looking for God. It is right here. A lot of people look for Jesus. They look for God. And some people are afraid of God. Never, never, never be afraid of God. All you in grave sin listening to me, especially you who had abortions and other kind of sins, don't be afraid of God. Be afraid of these two-legged creatures that you're walking around with. That's the ones you got to be afraid of. They're the ones that tell all your secrets. God never does that. They're the ones that have a hard time forgiving. God never has a hard time forgiving. And you need to, you need to, to want God. You're only true to yourself when you are with God, because then you know yourself. You've got to know yourself. And, and many times, a people, somebody will come up to you and say, why do you do this? It's so aggravating. And you would say, I don't do that. That happened to me one time. We were going around the table one morning, like, uh, 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 telling each other our faults. And uh, so it came to me, and they're all kind of hesitant, you know. <laughs> So I thought, oh, come on, I don't mind. <laughs> and I had my Bible open like this, see. And uh, Regina says, uh, well, it aggravates me when you keep doing this. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, I don't do that. <laughs> and I was doing that. <laughs> it was funny. <clears throat> see, the greatest light you have is when you know how far in darkness you are. Isn't that amazing, huh? When you know, hey, I need a conversion experience. I can't control myself. I need a conversion. That's the greatest light. See, there's all kinds of light, isn't it? There's the light that comes from the sun. And it can heal you or burn you. It can destroy, as it does in a desert, and it can build, as it does in a jungle. Well, we're kind of like the sun. We can build or we can destroy. This litany destroys all creation and all reality of God as he is, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and replaces it with something Unbelievably bad. Unbelievable. And so, 
if I am going to know myself, then I'm in the light. And if you say you're perfect, you're in the darkness. How do you like that? See? Let's see what St. Paul says here. Well, I lost my plate. Here it is. He said, that is why God has left them to their filthy enjoyments and practices. They have given up divine truth for a lie. They worship and serve creatures instead of the Creator, <laughs> who is blessed forever. They refuse to see that it is ra rational to, to acknowledge God. That's something we're very afraid of. And that's why we have a hard time evangelizing. Do you feel comfortable talking about God? In some places, in a workplace, this young boy told me a couple of weeks ago, he said, you know, I can't put a picture of Jesus or a saint or anything on my desk. We're not allowed because that's separation of church and state. But he said, I put my sister's picture on my desk and she's a religious. <laughs> and they can't say a thing because she's my sister. Isn't that ignorance, huh? How can you separate God from his creation? Can you see how that's darkness, huh? That's total darkness. When God's presence and love threatens you, you're in darkness. So how can it threaten me? Holiness, his demands, we want to do our own thing. Well, St. Paul says something about that. When we do this, let me tell you all the things we get into, see if it looks familiar. We get steeped in all sorts of depravity. Greed, ooh, malice, envy. You know, if you're jealous, you're jealous of people. But if you're envious, you're envious of things. Mary just got a Cadillac. Look what I'm driving. You get there the same way she does probably the same time she does. So what's the difference if you drive a Cadillac or some jalopy? You're both getting the same place and got the same gasoline. She doesn't go to a special gasoline for Cadillacs. Scooters and all these, what do you call these things? You drive two-wheelers, motorcycles. They're all, they're all going the same gasoline. Oh, that was funny. I thought if you got an expensive car, you ought to have special gasoline sprinkled with gold or something. <laughs> we get jealous about things. Things people wear, their talents. It's stupid to be jealous of people's talents because they didn't give it to themselves. God gave it to them. So, why should I be jealous if you're an artist? And I can't draw a straight line. My mother had a beautiful handwriting, absolutely phenomenal. And me, oh. oh, she would get so angry when I would write something. She would say, Matt, you're, you're 18 years old, you can't write your name. But I didn't have that talent. She used the old Palmer method, y'all. In your 60s, knows what that is. You went around, 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 and every time I went around, around, the circle went everywhere. You know, <laughs> and I never did catch on. Well, that's a talent she had. I didn't have it. You see, so jealousy of people of their talents and what they can do doesn't make any sense. Talents of riches, well, they can't help if they're born in it or they, they earned it. 
You see, we spend a lot of time in darkness. All that is darkness, isn't it? All that is darkness. Because we are not able in our lives to separate what's real from what's false. And he continues wrangling, treachery, spite. He must have had a hard day. <laughs> Libelers, slanderers, rude. Boy, I wonder he had somebody in mind. Arrogant and boastful, enterprising in sin. Oh, there's a lot of that today. All you that sell, sell pornography. Rebellious to parents. Without brains. Oh, he had a bad day. <laughs> without honor, without love, without pity. But doesn't it kind of sound like today? I'll never forget the woman who called me in tears. She had nine children. She was in a convalescent home. In two years, not one of them went to see her. That's darkness, isn't it? Huh? They're in, they're in darkness. Grave darkness. So what I want to tell you tonight is that you need to look at yourself and be honest. Are you in the light? Do you know Jesus? Do you want to be like Jesus? Or is the world and has the world grabbed you so tightly that darkness, you're comfortable in darkness? Hmm. See, that's why repentance is so important, huh? Well, try to remember that. We have a call. Hello? Oh, hello. Uh, good oh. evening, Mother. Thank <laughs> you for taking my call. Well, it's fine. Where are you from? I'm uh, from Miami. And what is your question? Well, I, uh, I have a teacher who, who sort of uh, guides me spiritually, and she tells me that the world is in need of a lot of forgiveness today. Yeah. And I was wondering if this evening you could speak a little bit about God's love and forgiveness for man. And how in 1 Corinthians 13, uh, St. Paul tells us that's the greatest gift. Well, you said 1 Corinthians? Yeah, chapter 13. 13 chapter. Here we are. Yes, that's to be ambitious for the higher gifts. Mercy is an awesome gift of God to us. See, God gives me mercy. The fact I wake up in the morning, it's an act of God's mercy. He knows. Before nine o'clock, Angelica will either blow it <laughs> or be impatient, whatever. The other day, I made the sisters laugh. Uh, we read where God said that uh, Moses was the gentlest of men. And I thought, well, I don't know about that, you know. He murdered a man. He got so hot-tempered and angry with the Jews, he broke the Ten Commandments all over him, you know, and pow! <laughs> so I thought, well, I would like God's definition of gentleness. And I said to the sisters, maybe I got it, don't know it. <laughs> the sisters looked at me and said, uh-uh. <laughs> no, mother, you would all that, but. But in spite of my faults and weaknesses and temper and all the rest that I am, God lets me wake up every morning. That's an act of God's mercy. I think old age is the most wonderful gift God can give us. 
I prayed that I live a long time and can make as many people miserable as I can. <laughs> and I can see people looking at the TV and say, that old woman making us miserable again. <laughs> but it is a gift. It's an act of God, because every day, Every day, I'm 72, every day I learn something new about God. I learn something new about myself. None of it good, but I, I, I get to know it. I can love more today. I can give something to God that I didn't give him yesterday. And I can grow in the image of Jesus. That's why, please don't pull that plug too early. Please, wait. You don't know how many graces and gifts. We talk a lot about the quality of life. Well, raise it up and talk about our quality in heaven. Maybe that person needs a few, a few days more to repent, tell Joe Jesus I'm so sorry. You say, well, they're brain dead. How do you know that? Your little machines tell you that? God and the soul live alone. And in those times, God speaks to the soul. Even doctors will say that you lose your hearing less. I don't know how they know that either. But I think it's, it's a significant that that's true. But you lose your hearing last. Because once you hear, you can make a decision. You can say, Jesus, I love you. Jesus, I'm sorry. I went to a man that they said was brain dead. But that rigor mortis had set in. He was on all kind of machines. And I whispered an act of contrition in his ear. And I said, Jesus loves you. He's coming for you. And out of this so-called dead man came the biggest tears I ever saw. His tears, his eyes just welled up and the tears started coming down one eye. And ten minutes later he died. He heard me. Had they pulled the plug ahead of time? I just want you to know there may be times, but be careful. When they start throwing at you quality of life, if I love this person, it doesn't matter how sick they are. See, we're beginning to get in our minds a mentality of death, not life. Be careful. We have another call. Hello? Hello. Oh, well, where are you from? I'm from Massachusetts. How are you? How old are you? I'm seven years old. And what is your question? Well, I don't really have a question, but I just want to tell you this. Um, when I grow up, I want to be a nun like you. Thank you. <laughs> and, and I love you. And thank you. Is that it? Yeah. <laughs> Well, sweetheart, I thank you for that. The nicest compliment I've ever had. Just keep close to Jesus. You see, at this point, this child has light. She has light. She wants to give herself to God. That's light, huh? And that light comes from God. It comes right from God, and we can't smother it. With the world, with the flesh, with sin, we can't smother it. You know,
keep that in your mind, sweetheart. Just say, Jesus, show me the way. And I, I forgot to ask your name, but I will pray for you every day. We have another call. Hello? Hello, Mother Angelica. Where are you from? My name is Bob, and I'm calling from Minneapolis. And what is your question? My wife and I are former Protestants who are considering converting to the Catholic Church. Thank you, Jesus. And we wanted to ask you about what the Catholic view of the, like a picture image of purgatory would be, because as Protestants, we've always kind of had this image of sort of like a junior grade hell with a lot of suffering going on and so forth. Could you tell us, is there suffering in purgatory and how that compares to like the suffering in hell? There is no junior grade hell. <laughs> if you're in hell, you're in hell. The worst kind. Purgatory is different. It is suffering. Uh, but I, I read a beautiful book on purgatory written by a bishop, I forget his name now, but I think it was the best I ever read. When you die, you shall see God face to face. You see Jesus face to face, suddenly, there he is. All his awesome wonder, majesty, holiness, oh, and love for you. For the first time in your life, you will know, feel, and understand how much he loved you, how much mercy he bestowed upon you, how many graces you had, how many times you said no, how many times you said yes. It will come in a flash, and Jesus, Jesus will stand there like this to you. Here's the suffering. When you see yourself so clear, you, you want to go, but you can't. You see, there, there's such a difference between you and Jesus. Such a vast difference. You can't. And there's the suffering. Unbelievable suffering from the fact that I wanted to go and I couldn't. It's like missing God so much with all your heart, mind, and soul. Missing Him. It's an awesome suffering. They're not, I don't think, real fire, fire. Because we don't have a body, but we have a soul. And that soul suffers from the fire of desire for God, the fire of repentance for the first time maybe in our entire life. We know what it was to sin and the consequences, and we're so sorry. But not regret. There's no regret in purgatory. There's an awesome joy along with awesome suffering because I am on my way. I've always said to the sisters, when I die and find myself in purgatory, the first thing I'm going to say is, well, I made it. <laughs> I mean, at least I'm there. And I, I don't have to worry about not being saved. I want a joy that would be, huh? You could see a lot of your friends there. You'd be surprised at how many of you thought were in the lower region or in the middle region. <laughs> but it's a place, yes, it's a place of suffering, a place of joy, not the kind of joy in heaven, but the joy that comes, I have seen him. I have seen him. My soul has seen the Lord God. At that point, no amount of suffering is too much because I know what I didn't do and I know I have to be purified. All I want is to be purified so I can run to Jesus, and that's purgatory. We have another call. Hello? Yes, hello, Mother. Where are you from? From Carlock, Illinois. And what is your question? 
Yes, well, first of all, I just want to say that I think St. Paul must have been Italian, don't you, the way he expressed himself? <laughs> <laughs> I thought that most of the apostles were Italian Jews because all they thought about was eating. <laughs> Anyway, Mother, uh, what is your favorite Bible story? And God bless you. I'll hang up and listen. New Testament or old? She's gone. Well, I'll give you the New Te Old Testament first. My favorite story is Elias. That's crony old prophet. I love that man. I can just see him before Jezebel and all her prophets. And all the Jews had gone over to Baal. He says, look, all of you, get yourself a sacrifice, a bull or whatever it is. I'll get one. And we'll put it on this fire. We'll put it on this uh, altar and um, call down fire from heaven. Whatever God calls it down, that's the God. Isn't that great? Huh? I just, man. And so these prophets get there and they start dancing all around and they call on Baal and they cut themselves with knives. And, and in the middle of it, he says, hey, why don't you cry louder? Maybe he fell asleep. <laughs> oh, I love that guy. Woo. And so they cry louder and nothing happens. And he says, hey, maybe he went on a trip. Finally, it's time for the evening sacrifice. Here comes Elias. And he puts the, la the uh, calf on there, cuts it in half. Now, this is a time of great drought when there's very little water. She says, get me a gallon of water. So they pour a gallon of water over there. Give me another one. They gave another gallon of water. Give me another one. So he wets the, the wood, the sacrifice, everything. Is he done? No. That little guy says, God, show these people you're the real God. The calf was gone. The water would licked up in the fire. That's my favorite. See, it matches my disposition. <laughs> That's how I would solve a lot of problems, see. <laughs> My favorite, and I read it very often, is the 21st chapter of John in the New Testament. I try to live my life by that 21st chapter. The apostles were after Pentecost, I mean after the resurrection, and they went fishing, kind of a normal thing to do. They didn't catch anything, which was also normal for them. They're coming in and they see someone on the shore. They don't know who it is. He said, friends, have you caught anything? <laughs> I would have said, Peter said no, which was the honest thing to say. I would have said, I didn't go fishing. <laughs> I went out to meditate. Peter, no, he said, no, no excuses, nothing, just plain no. So the Lord said, uh, throw your net on stubborn side, wrong side of the boat. It's dawn, and they're almost to shore. If you just throw the net out, it's going to hit sand. You know why it's my favorite part, huh? Because they did it. And they got so much fish, they didn't know what to do with it. And John said, it's the Lord. Peter put his cloak on him because he was naked. Runs to Jesus. And then Jesus said something for them. He said, bring in the fish you have caught. Oh. <laughs> He told him when, where, how, and then he put the fish in the net. But he said, you have caught. 
I can testify to that. Everything here. Everything on the mountain. Every signal going around the world. He did. He got the signal. He got the people together. And it went around the world. I forgot the strange country or strange place in a country I heard today. A priest was going from his office and he passed by this bar and there were so many people in there they were out of the door. And he thought, what's going on in there? He stuck his head in the door and they were all watching the papal visit on EWTN. I thought, only God can do that. But I thought if he'd missed all those boys and all the people who went to, to New York and New Jersey and, and Baltimore and, and worked 12, 14, 16 hours a day, he would have said, come and look at the signal you put on there. No, you put it on. Everybody put it on. And so that's my two favorite scriptures, Elias and 21st chapter of John. There's one in the epistles, it says, and we with our unveiled faces grow brighter and brighter as we are turned into the image we reflect. And that's the, the work of the Spirit who is Lord. That's my epistle favorite passage. I said to the sisters, when I die, put that on my tombstone. Because that is to me what we're after. Even if we don't get it, we keep striving, striving. We have another call. Hello? Um, yes. <laughs> uh, Where are you from? Louisiana. And what is your question? I have a religious teacher mm -hmm. who tells us women should be priests. What? That women should be priests. How long are you in that school? <laughs> Ma'am? How long do you have to be in that school? Oh, I'm in eighth grade. Well, sweetheart, you tell her that the Holy Father said there will never be a woman priest, so why can't she be obedient? You see, a teacher who teaches religion should not teach disobedience to the Holy Father. They don't belong there. See, this is, the, this is the darkness today. Teachers who don't pay attention to the Holy Father, he could say anything he wants, they don't pay attention. How can anyone teach light when he's in darkness by teaching disobedience? Women cannot be priests, sweetheart. God has not ordained that, you see? That's that power thing again. We want to do something God doesn't want us to do. Now we want five genders. <laughs> We're having enough trouble with two. You see, and, and, and people believe this. God does not will. See, the whole object of a priest, the whole reason for a priest, that he is another Christ. A woman is another Christ in her heart. By her holiness, as Mary was, she was Christ-like. But she cannot, take, she cannot take the place of Christ. A woman cannot offer sacrifice in the name of Jesus. We can't. And I'm sure somebody somewhere will ordain a woman, but she won't be any more priest after than she was before. It'll be a, a blasphemous thing. What do you need to do is go to homeschool? You know what the Holy Father said, huh? When he was here, he said, the primary role of parents is to teach their children, especially religion and catechism. Flunk the course rather than by the lie. You hear that? 
flunk the course, rather than by the lie. There was a, a young student came to me, said she flailed in her tests because the, the question was, what is the difference between a witch, magic, and the Eucharist? She says, there is no resemblance. The Eucharist is the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus. She failed. Thank God she failed. Remember, my dear friends and family, be children of light. Do not tolerate darkness. If you do, then you will be a child of darkness. Stand tall even to your teacher, not in disobedience, but truth is truth. We must teach the truth. In the truth is light, in the truth is joy, in the truth is happiness. I've always found that the people who do not teach the truth are kind of sad sack. You never notice that? If you want to be filled with the joy Jesus promised, we must speak the truth from our hearts and live the truth. So please be generous. Put us between your gaps and electric bill. And I'll see you tomorrow night. Bye now.